Good evening, friends. I'm glad you're back with us again for another class about the importance of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, we are going to explore uh, the backstory, if you will, uh, the Old Testament, why it's important to understand that. So I hope you're ready. hope you have your Bibles. hope you have your pad and paper, your iPhones for your Bible, cup of coffee, chamomile tea, whatever it is. Let's get ready, okay? Father, thank you again. We celebrate your death, resurrection of Jesus. We love you. We thank you. Father, it's our life. And as we explore, Lord, just open our eyes to understanding tonight about why this is so important. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the idea of the sacrifice has its beginnings all the way back in Genesis. Um, as I've been trying to convey to you, this is not something that God all of a sudden said, this is my, you know, break glass if, if, if nothing else works plan. He had been planning this from the beginning of creation. In fact, it's interesting, when you go back to the book of Genesis, uh, you even see the idea when Adam and Eve discovered their nakedness or realized it, whatever the term uh, would be, uh, that, that, that animal skins were fashioned by God. Animals had to die to clothe both Adam and Eve. And they, the animals had to give of themselves to be able to do that. So you even see the institution of sacrifice through God doing that from the animals to Adam and Eve. Now, the one where, where people are consciously actually active in sacrifice, I need you to turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, and I want to just read this very quickly with you. In verse 1, it says, Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother, Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. And in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord, now come on, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord, here it is, had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. Now, again, let, let's let's take a few moments, not, not a long time, but a few moments, because it's interesting, because when you read this, it says, in the course of time, Cain did this. Uh, this doesn't seem to be an action that is instituted by God to Cain and Abel and said, hey, Cain and Abel. Yeah, I would think if, the, if God had told them that, um, Genesis would have recorded that. That's my own personal belief. But it doesn't. It says it looks like it's out of their own will. Cain first brought fruit. And Adam brought, I'm sorry, <laughs> Cain brought uh, the fruit and Abel brought the firstborn of the flock. And it said, the one that God regarded and was pleased with. This is important to understand because then we get into Cain and Abel's relationship and the killing and everything. But God is pleased with the offering of the lamb and not the offering of the fruit. I, I don't know if I read into that, that uh, Cain was evil and Abel was this joyous, happy person. I don't read into that. I look at the presentation and I say, this is what God, from the beginning, instituted. This is what we knew would bring, would please him. And that is the surrendering of a life, not just the surrendering of fruit. So even from the beginning, you, you see God's hand in saying, that, that a life, a lamb, a sheep, in this particular scenario. This is what will please me. They didn't have any explanation on it. He just said it. That's what will happen. 
Now, go to Genesis 22, and I want you to look at verse 11, because we're going to look at a very famous episode involving Abraham and Isaac. And as we know, Abraham brought Isaac, laid him on the altar, and God said, you, you will sacrifice your son to me. Now, we knew that wasn't going to happen. In fact, Abraham, in Hebrews later, said he, he always believed that God would spare his son. But, but at this point, he followed through. In verse 11 of Genesis 22, I hope you're there, says, The angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the boy or anything, or do anything to him. For now I know you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Now, again, there's the scenario. It was the, the offering of a life, of, of blood to be poured out that was acceptable to God, nothing else. Now, it's interesting, when you go through the scripture, you see Noah, Isaac, Jacob, Job. They all brought sacrifices to God. And, and of course, we know that in Leviticus is where we find the different offerings that God um, used and it was acceptable to him to combat the sin in the life of the Israelites. And, and there are many different sacrifices. Time doesn't allow us to go through them tonight, but each of them involved the, uh, well, most of them, I should say. I can't say all of them, but most of the ones that involved for sin um, involve the killing of a spotless lamb. And it all had a purpose. In fact, Leviticus 5.10 tells us this. Listen, listen to this. The priest shall make atonement for him for the sin that he has, forg that he has committed and he shall be forgiven. Let, let me go a little bit deeper on this. Listen to what it says. On the day of atonement... The day of forgiveness. The, the priest was required to lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel, all their transgressions and all their sins. That's Leviticus 16, uh, verse 22. Are, are you seeing that? Place his hands and all the sins. He would confess all of those sins. And then as the animal's blood poured out, that was acceptable by God. And that's the substitutionary sacrifice. And so in the Old Testament, friends, you're looking at an entire idea that says, now, now some would say, why, why did the sacrifice have to be an animal? Well, if you look at it just as the Old Testament and not the New um, you can come up with a lot of ideas. Some of them uh, would be unfair, you would say, I would suggest. You, you know, why would an animal have to die? And They're helpless and, and, and they can't do anything. And, and yeah, I, I get that. If you look at it just as an Old Testament idea and, and nothing more, you could raise that argument. Um, you know, you could raise the argument that, um, you know, instead of a human life, uh, the animal, God told us that men are going to take care of it. There's, there's many ideas that can come out, okay? But what I would suggest to you that you have to look at is it tying in to the New Testament, tying in to what would happen to Jesus as our sacrifice. Friends, we, we can't lose that idea. It's very important that we see that all of this setup in the Old Testament was brought to say, this is what Jesus will do. All of this is here because it's a preparation that God was making for the ultimate of sacrifices. And that's Jesus, the once for all. Now, I need you to turn to your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter number 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Because 
the, the sacrifice of Christ, the death of Christ, excelled over the sacrifices of the Old Covenant. The New Covenant excelled over the Old Covenant. And the writer of Hebrews brought some very interesting points that we'll find in, in Hebrews chapter number 9. And we're going to skip through some of the verses. We're not going to read them all right in a row. I'm going to hit some of them uh, up and down. So you'll need to follow with this, okay? But, but I'm going to offer to you um, five, four areas that show from Hebrews how death, Christ's death excelled over the death of the Old Covenant. Why this one was once and for all, as opposed to them doing it every day and every week and every month and all of those sacrifices. All right? Verses 6 and 7. I want you to look at Hebrews chapter number 9. All right? Hebrews 6, uh, Hebrews 9, verse 6 and 7. It says, Now when these things had been thus prepared... The priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle, performing the services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. Do, do you understand? That that's where God is saying. The first thing you need to see is guys, Christ's sacrifice was offered once and for all. Move on down to verse number 11. And you see verse 11, it says, But Christ came as the high priest of the good things to come, and with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place. Here's the key. Once for all having obtained eternal redemption. This excels because Christ's sacrifice, according to God, is the only one you need. This was being done on a continual basis. But for Christ, God said, listen, this is, this is the model, but I'm going to accept Jesus and his blood, his perfect blood, is going to cover that sin. That's why you commit yourself to him. So you see, his death was a once for all. Not, I need to do this. He needs to do this again and again and again. We don't have a holiday where Christ dies every year. We remember his death. That's what Good Friday, um, to some would be a misnomer of words, uh, you know, how ironic I should say that, you know, his death was good and it was good. It was good for us, good for him, good for the Lord, because it brought us back. All right? But you see, that's the first thing to understand. This sacrifice was once and done. And that's what we accept and receive. Now look at verses 9 and 10 of Hebrews chapter 9. Again, we're going to be skipping over. It's okay. I want to bring some of these points in, in these orders, okay? Verses 9 and 10. And it says it was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience, concerned only with food, drinks, various washings, and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. There's your symbolic. And the second thing we need to know is this, Christ's sacrifice affected sin it affected e-f-f-e-c-t-e-d how did it affect it it removed it see the sacrifice of the old time was symbolic it was acceptable for god to say you're doing this and so symbolically i will remove it i will not hold this to your charge we'll say but christ his death actually removed the spirit of sin from mankind. Do you understand? <clears throat> it wasn't a symbol anymore. It was an actual transformation. It's not one that we see. It's not even one that we feel. We, we don't necessarily feel the sin you know, removed from us. It would have been a great Spielberg movie, you know, where you would have all these things coming out. And, but, but that's not what happened. 
It's something we don't see, but it's something that happened. You see, that's why the ones, they, they, they could only go so far. There was always a ceiling with the Old Testament sacrifices. But with the New Testament, once and for all, Jesus, hallelujah, it was done. You understand? So it affected sin. It's not symbolic. But yet we, we've talked about the fact that we fight because we're human. We're, we're not chained to sin. We may choose to sin, but we're not chained to sin. And that's where we need to hold on to what God has. Now, the third thing, uh, I think this is a, a wonderful description, okay? It says verse 1 of, of chapter 9. Indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary, for a tabernacle was prepared in the first part, key, in which was the lampstand, the table, the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. The third thing I want you to see is that Christ's sacrifice was accepted in heaven. It was acceptable to God. My friend, you can't lose that idea. It was acceptable to God. Look at verse 23. Therefore it was necessary that the copies of these things in heaven should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves were better, better sacrifices than these. This sacrifice was accepted in heaven. That's the true temple. <clears throat> That's, this is just the, the model, if you will, the earthly creation, that the tabernacle of what they had at that time. Um, See, it didn't symbolize by God accepting this idea himself in the true temple. Forgiveness is assured. So this was not, this is just a model I'll read for the real deal. This is saying, this is the one that we have been waiting for. This is the one that allows forgiveness truly to come. See, that's why it's so great to accept this one, my friends, to hold on. And then the final thing that I think is just, is so exciting. And there's more that abound, but I, just for our study today, just a few. Verse 7, <clears throat> and it says, and I want to remind, we, we've been through this again, but I want to look at verse 7 and then verse 8. But into the second part, the high priest went in alone for a year, uh, once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. We went through that. That's what we said in the beginning. He offered it once and for all. Look at verse 8. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was standing. The final thing we see here in this particular study is Christ's sacrifice gained access to God. You see, although there was a sacrifice, it did not connect us back to God. It allowed us to, or the Jewish people, I should say, to please God. But it never reconciled us back to God. Remember the veil in the Holy of Holies? Who went in? The high priest went in. Right? What was the, It was covered up. Nobody could see what would happen. And only that high priest could be there. But now that the sacrifice of Christ came, now that it was accepted in the true temple, the veil where God is, the Holy of Holies, the veil, as we know, was ripped on Christ's death. Remember that? The veil was ripped, torn open, and it gave access. See, this is why, oh, friends, we have access to God. We pray directly to to, we talk to God. Do you understand the privilege of talking to God and not having to go to somebody and say, well, listen, you tell him and let me know what he says. No. You have the privilege of talking to the Savior. You see, that's what his sacrifice did. So the Old Testament one could never do that. It can never, that's why there were prophets and that's why there, there were speakers and everything. He never gained us access directly to God. 
even of the greatest. But today in the new covenant, the new testament of grace and mercy, God allows us to have full access with him. Oh, my friends, that's why we don't have to think about animal sacrifice and pleasing God. That's why we don't have to worry about our own blood being spilled out for God to be happy. We just need to accept the one who did it once and for all. That's the message. Why did Christ have to die? Because he was the ultimate sacrifice, the one that God would accept once and for all. His, his, the acceptance of his death, the sacrifice of his death, was pleasing to God. And God said, okay, now we can have communion. Now we can have relationship tied in together. Isn't that exciting? Oh, think of that. Think of the fact that you have an unfettered connection to God 24-7. You talk to him. Yes, I, I would suggest to some, boy, if we could see a face and, 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 and be able to hear a voice and God say, don't worry. Listen, the Bible tells us that, that we have something better and that's our faith. It's our faith. Remember what he said to uh, Doubting Thomas? He goes, you're blessed because you've seen my hands and my feet. Greater blessing comes to those who have not seen and yet they believe. That's you. So hold on to the truth of what God's given you, friends. Oh, this is going to be a great, great time for studying the Word of God. Are, are, are you ready to continue on in the coming weeks? Boy, I hope so. May God's blessing be with you. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much in Jesus' name for this wonderful opportunity again to just serve you, to love you, to care. And Father, I pray you would help us in our understanding. Lord, that your sacrifice is once and for all. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. See you next week, guys. God bless.